Go. Okay, I'd like to call the April 27th, 2017 meeting of the Scarborough Sanitary District trustees to order. The roll call, Joe Carroll. Here. Aubrey Strauss. Here. Ben Viola. Here. Jason Greenwood. Here. Rob McSorley. Here. Nick Rico. Here. And I'm Charles Andrews. Approval of the minutes of the February 23rd, 2017. So moved. Second. Second. Any corrections or omissions? If not, all those in favor? None opposed. Second. Superintendent's operation. Thank you. First, I want to thank Glenn for um, uh, standing in for me last month and doing an incredible job. And thanks to the, the wonders of the internet, I was actually able to watch him perform live. Um, so I, I really appreciate Glenn standing in and giving me the opportunity to attend to some family business. Um, a uh, copy of the monthly operations uh, report for the month of March is included in your packet. Our average effluent flow for the month was 1.47 million gallons today, per day. Our effluent quality was well within our permitted limits. We averaged 94% uh, VOD removal and 94% TSS removal with uh, concentrations of 15 milligrams per liter at 100 And 14, 15 milligrams per liter and 14 milligrams per liter. Um, a copy of the pump station flows from the month of March is also included in your packet. We continue to investigate the high flows in the industrial park, Liberty Road, pump station areas. Uh, Rudy and Scott did identify two leaking cleanouts, uh, which had the frost and paper park, uh, which we have since repaired. Uh, this work is ongoing, and I feel there's more issues in that area that um, I'm confident we'll continue to identify as we continue to work. Um, for the second time, I presented at the Wentworth uh, School's team, STEAM night, which is Science, te uh, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. Um, and that was on April 12th. Uh, similar to last year, I had used an, an Enviroscape model uh, that simulates uh, stormwater runoff. I had an effluent identification contest where the students tried to identify the treated effluent amongst several other water samples, including uh, the river water, uh, ocean water, uh, drain, uh, storm drains, and the likes. I had a microscope set up uh, such that they could view the microbiology that we used to treat the wastewater, and I had some fun stickers for the kids. Uh, uh, one difference this year is my son Alden helped out and ran the Enviroscape demonstration model, and a picture of the uh, table setup I provided for you in the packet. I hope that's not his head in the corner of the picture. <laughs> the bald one? No, that is not. <laughs> the long-haired boy at the other end of the table. Is him. Good job. Uh, Carol and uh, Paul finished installing the new Penn Valley Waste Activated Sludge Pumps. As you know, Paul, Carol and Paul came, over, came in over a weekend to complete the initial pump replacement to ensure uninterrupted operation at the plant. Provide you with a couple pictures of that. Um, uh, the replacement of the suction valves at the state at the industrial park pump station was completed without any issues. In order to complete this work, the flow of the pump station was interrupted uh, to, fill, uh, to, to, to facilitate it. It was completed on again on another weekend on Saturday, March 25th, during a period of low flow. That's all I have with regards to the. Uh, Operations report. Any questions for Superintendent? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I was curious, how many Penn Valley pumps did you have installed? We installed three. three. Good. And what are you doing with the old hose pumps? I believe they're going to wells. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Just check out. <laughs> we will be putting them on a uh, website and we will be going up for bid auction. Okay, good luck. Appreciate the humor there. For those who are watching, uh, 
Nick Rico is the superintendent down at the Wells Cemetery. So I and we won't be bidding on that. Thank you very much. Just one. Uh, is there any theory on what's going on in the industrial park of the Bureau of Stations? It's been going on for some time now. Uh, it's a, there's some old pipe in the area. We did find a section of pipe that has settled and it uh, does have, um, it is flooded so that we can't see it, that we can't TV it. Uh, what we do plan on doing is um, isolating the flow above above it to see whether we're getting the flow within that area. That's really the only way. And if, if that's the case, we're going to have to uh, dig a new pair. Um, so that's, that was my next question. Do you need to take any infrastructure changes? Uh, my guess is that it's going to have to be someplace. Okay. Once we find it. Thank you. Yeah. I'd just like to say thanks for the steam night. Uh, Presentation to the kids. I'm sure you I'm sure you fueled some of the imagination from some of those kids about some possible uh, values from uh, science and engineering uh, and math uh, topics, and maybe you get a couple of uh, engineers or architects out of that approach at some point in the future. Sure, I will. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. It was a great reach out. And I'll just add on to that, that the Enviroscape model itself lives pretty much with me. It's in my car right now. So if you want to borrow that sometime, if anybody has a, an event that they've been invited to that you want to, I can give you a little training session on it. I can make it available sometime. You know, cool. It's owned by Maine Water Environment Association, but I try to keep an eye on it. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next slide. Where are our stickers this year? I didn't bring you one. Actually, they, by, I had made up two sets of stickers this year. The, uh, the ones that you, I provided you with last year actually were uh, exhausted during the meeting, during oh, okay. the presentation. But I had, I had another one that was um, a cartoon character of a dinosaur, and it, and it, it, it was uh, all water is dinosaur pee. But thank, thank you, the water cycle. <laughs> and what did the other sticker say, Dave? I pooped today. And where did you get that idea, Dave? That came from you, Rob. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough out of context uh, reporting here. Uh, next item is correspondence. Um, Gary Howard uh, provided with his official resignation. Um, after 46 years of working for the district, Gary will be retiring on June 9th, officially of this year, and uh, Gary is a wealth of knowledge and has spearheaded many positive changes for the district over those years, and I personally will miss working alongside with Gary. Can I make an official motion to uh, not accept this resignation? Um, I think that Gary is in North Carolina at this moment. I believe he's halfway haven't, there. Haven't, haven't been on the road since 4 o'clock this morning. He could be there by now. Uh, so that would probably be inappropriate, but we appreciate the sentiment. Uh, I guess I would, I would like to, for the record, uh, state that uh, Gary Howard has been one of the key people at the Scarborough Sanitary District since probably 1972, thereabouts. Um, I came to Scarborough in 1975. Gary was working for the Sanitary District at that point in time, and they they lived in the uh, they lived in the uh, actually in the treatment plant. Their their desks were on the grates above the. They're on the inlet grates, basically, in the, uh, in the plant, um, and it was a two-person, it was a two-person operation at the time. Um, and I have to say, I was most impressed by Gary when I first met him when I came to Scarborough. His enthusiasm for the job. He was just a young guy who was always thinking about what's the next thing he could do to better the situation at the Scarborough Sanitary. And he never changed that philosophy for the entire 
duration of employment for the district. And uh, when I was the superintendent at the district, uh, we had a few very hairy scenarios that developed uh, with uh, broken force mains and things of that ilk. And uh, he was a tremendous resource of being able to try and manage to get through some of those scenarios. So um, always, always, always on call. Literally uh, 365 days a year for 46, 7, how many years was it? 40, 46. 46 years. Um, and uh, was a great example for our employees. So I can't say enough positive things about the contribution that Gary has made, and he's certainly going to be missed um, at the district. So thank you, Gary Howard. Any other comments? Uh, I'll comment and echo yours. The continual improvement that I learned from Gary, I try to implement in my own work life. He was a great resource to tap into, and I've never seen a cleaner pump station as one that was run by him. You could eat off the floor. Not that I would, but you could eat off the floor. His standard set them so high that, you know, Star Wars was the cleanest plant in the state. And it's all due to Gary and his inspiration and his management. He's a great guy. You're going to miss him. Yeah. All right, next item is old business. Uh, there is no old business. New business, 79 Musty Road. On behalf of Ms. Bear Properties, uh, Northeast Civil Solution requested district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer the wastewater from a proposed 84 unit apartment complex consisting of seven apartment buildings. The project will be serviced by a private gravity sewer system uh, and discharged into the, an existing gravity sewer on Muzzy Road. The proposed sewer work includes approximately 620 linear feet of 8 inch diameter gravity sewer with 8 manholes and, a, and sewer services to each of the 7 new apartment buildings. I recommend approval with the following conditions. The project is within the 8 corner sewer district with a flow allocation for one single family dwelling unit. The city fee of the apartments are subject to the district's capacity reserve fee that fee is based on a single family residential dwelling units without accessory units. Any additional homes, apartments, dwelling units, accessory units in excess of this are subject to additional approvals and capacity reserve fees. The current capacity reserve fee per dwelling unit is $3,104.33 and is adjusted monthly based on the ENR. Based on uh, the current rate, the proposed product of the total capacity reserve fee due is $257,659.39. The proposed sewer system shall remain private and the operation and maintenance of the system will be the responsibility of the owner. A copy of the recorded subdivision plan uh, depicting the amended district approvals shall be provided to the district in both paper and electronic format. Um, all sewer services shall have detectable underground utility marking tape placed approximately three feet below grade, directly above the pipe and trace of water installed adjacent to the sewer. Also, it shall be installed at a minimum depth of four feet. Final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer shall be submitted to the superintendent for approval prior to the of the permits. The sewer permit is required for each building. A uh, complete application associated with each of the the district at the time the permit is executed. The sewer extension permit is required. That application shall be submitted to the district prior to any work being executed. And then finally, record plans, uh, professionally surveyed electronic geo reference category stamp PDF um, shall be submitted to the district upon completion of the project. Motion to approve. Second. Shaki, uh, do you have anything that you wanted to address to the board? Or? I, I don't. I appreciate the opportunity. I just wanted to be here in case there were questions. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any questions or comments? All right, we have a motion to approve. All those in favor? None opposed. Thank you very much. Get you home in time.
time for the uh, voice? Is that what it's? I might hang around for public comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next item 15 Washington Avenue. On behalf of Hugo Properties LLC, Stan Tech is requesting district approval to connect the discharge of the sewer of the sanitary waste water flow from the proposed 12,000 square foot building. The proposed building consists of eight small tenant units, each with a bathroom and an office. The site contains an existing six inch sanitary sewer service that services the existing 6,400 square foot building. The proposed building would time the existing sewer service with the installation of a sewer manifold over that existing sewer service. The site was originally approved for a flow of 300 gallons per day on July 15th, 1999. They are requesting approval for additional flow of 192 gallons per day of sanitary waste per flow, which is based on approximately two employees per unit and 12 gallons per day per employee. The entire site will be needed by one water main. I recommend approval with the following conditions. 192 gallons per day is subject to the capacity reserve fee. The current fee is 15 per gallon and is adjusted monthly. Uh, based on the current ENR, the total capacity reserve fee due is $2,979.50. Any flow above the 492 gallons per day will be subject to an additional approval of the capacity reserve fees. The flow is limited to 492 gallons per day of typical sanitary waste. Any future flows in excess of the above amount. The flow characteristics are subject to additional approvals. No process waste is allowed. No floor drains are permitted. Uh, conduct a CCTV inspection of the existing sewer service and repair any deficiencies discovered. Provide a district uh, copy of the report and documentation of the repairs. Sewer permits required. Um, uh, complete application associated fees shall be submitted to the district at the time of the time of this executed. Prior to that, no uh, sewer work shall be completed. Um, no floor drains. So, I already talked about that. Uh, chemical storage. All bulk chemical storage areas shall have secondary containment. And final plan shall be submitted to the district on issuance of uh, prior to issuance of the permits. And finally. Uh, professionally surveyed electronic material reference drawings be provided um, upon the completion of the project. Motion for approval. Second. Any, any questions? Comments, um, Robert? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just curious about the floor drain. Uh, the, the fact that they're listed as not being permitted, and the previous application didn't have that. So I guess two questions. Is there a specific concern with this property? Um, is it, I mean, one might be the chemical storage area, uh, but is there any other reason? And then second, more just a general question, and that is, do, does the district do an inspection of a property before occupancy is granted uh, in conjunction with code enforcement? Yes, uh, to answer your second question first, mm -hmm. yes, the district is involved through the construction process and code enforcement act. It does um, uh, work with us and checks in with us to make sure all our uh, requirements of that pr pr prior to issuance of occupancy. Yeah. Um, and going, uh, addressing your first question with regards to the floor drains, this being a, a commercial project versus a residential project, uh, the floor drains are addressed. Uh, we have a lot of floor drains in the past, but they require oil water separates. Mm -hmm. So, um, they had not requested the floor drain, so I wanted to specifically call them out and make sure they're not added unless like they address mm -hmm. the other issues. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, what's the purpose of the building? Is this that condo for contractors yeah. building? Then yeah. that we had already seen something before on that. Yes. All right. Thank you. So my question is, in ownership of the building, is this going to remain in single ownership? Because if it's going to be condo for contractors, uh, they're trying to sell off individual units? No, they're, they're, it's individually owned. Okay, so there'll be, so there'll be individual Please space will be leased from the, from the owner who will retain ownership of the entire place. Uh, and it would probably be prudent just to advise them that should they split off units or sell units in the future, that they're going to have to deal with uh, separating the water lines and meters, just as a point of information for their knowledge. Uh, David, uh, would it be better to have the uh, main hole at the 
property line for monitoring, or do you care based upon the location of it? Um, it doesn't bother me at all with regards to having it up uh, at that location. Um, you know, we have full rights of access. Do you have Other eastern rights to get into there? We do want to, as a result of uh, their nursery use of the Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Then. All those in favor of the motion? Yes. Okay, moving on, uh, 2016 annual audit and annual report. Um, Willette Associates uh, has completed the 2016 annual audit uh, of our uh, uh, financials, of the district financials, a copy of which uh, was provided uh, electronically to you just prior to the meeting, I believe yesterday. Uh, no significant issues of findings were identified. Uh, Mike Dunn from Willette Associates is here to make a presentation uh, with regard to the 2016 annual audit and our, our annual report is also included in that um, uh, report. So I'll turn it over to Mike. I know he has a presentation set up put together for, for you. Thanks, and uh, thank you for having me come down and present to everybody. Um, what I've provided uh, or brought down uh, for uh, audit materials is, your, is the, the bound financial statement for the district, and there's also a, a letter um, governance letter to the trustees. Um, it's a couple pages, uh, and I've also put together uh, kind of like a, a slide. For presentation uh, we'll just use it as a manual handout that kind of wraps it all together <clears throat> so um, as I go through the, the slide presentation of the handouts um, we can we can take a look at both the financial statements and that letter the letter was a separate letter so I'm not sure if everybody got it it's part of the packet or, or not but. so again just to kind of start with the slides and uh, to go over an overview of the audit. I mean, there, there are some, some people that are not very familiar with what an audit actually is, so I always put this slide in here for, for the purpose. Um, the, the trustees hire um, our firm, which is an independent accounting firm, to perform auditing procedures on uh, financial statements of the district. Um, what that does is it provides assurance to anybody who reads the annual financials that uh, what they're reading, the financial data, is, is accurate and complete. Uh, another purpose is, uh, of the audit is as we're in there, we do perform some procedures and review the internal controls over financial reporting of the district. And if we have any suggestions for improvement, we usually make those to management. And also, um, in, in order to uh, conform with, with government accounting policies and how to report financial statements, especially governmental financial statements, sometimes new standards come out, policies on how to do that, and, and we, we assist management in implementing those when they come out. So that's kind of the, the overview of what we do as part of the audit. Start out with uh, to go along with these slides is to cover this letter. Uh, this is a this is a required communication as a result of the audit. Uh, it basically outlines a few um, bolded areas and, 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 and points that we need to communicate to to the trustees and the management. And I've kind of summarized them here on this slide to go along with it. And I'll just go down through it real quick. Um, We're deciding what? This results, results in required okay. communications. Yep. So the qualitative aspects of accounting practices, this area covers three different subjects when it comes to the financial statements. One it talks about new accounting policies and standards adopted. Another area is significant estimates and also significant disclosures. 
Um, this is, of course, important that the trustees understand if, if there are any significant estimates or disclosures or even new standards that those are communicated directly as a result of the audit. Um, looking at the new accounting policies, there were two standards that were issued this year um, that the, the district adopted. GASB 72 deals with fair value measurement. Um, and GASB 76 deals with the hierarchy of generally accepted accounting principles for, for the state and local governments. Um, GASB 72, um, we recommended that to be adopted um, by the district um, as, as a, new, a new accounting policy, particularly because the, the district did get into some investments with their reserves this year. Uh, GASB 72 is a standard that requires when you have financial reporting um, that investments and in, in those type of um, securities that if the district invests in those, that they need to be reported on their financial statements at market value. Um, compared to other things such as, say, your capital assets, which are reported at cost, um, investments have to be recorded at fair market value um, by adopting GASB 72. And this goes kind of along with a, a for-profit entity or even a not-for-profit entity that have already been required to do so. So GASB, what GASB is doing is they created the standard to kind of bring the government um, reporting standards along with or up to um, for-profit and not-for-profit reporting standards. That impacts the um, district in a way where if, if you have um, investments at market value, um, you can imagine due to the markets, those, those values go up and down. Um, the following year, next year at this time, depending on where those market values stand, um, those changes in market values are called unrealized gains and losses. Those will, will actually flow through your operating statement as a uh, investment return. So you could potentially see some losses or you could potentially see some gains depending on the market value of those securities. Um, so that's why that's, that's, a, that's a standard that needs to be um, adopted. GASB 76, which is a hierarchy of, of generally accepted accounting principles for governments, this, this has very little impact on the district. It's primarily um, a standard that um, was issued by Government Accounting Standards Board that basically says that if they don't have a standard to address a certain accounting issue or accounting policy, um, the government is to follow for-profit um, policies or the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board standards. So it's kind of just like a kind of like a bridge standard. It doesn't really do much, but um, it, if you do get into some accounting issues and there isn't a, a government accounting standard that, that addresses those, you would follow the full profit standards. Any questions on those? So you mentioned we, this year we've gotten into investment assets. Well, I don't even know if we did. What did we get into? That? They're mostly treasury loans. Oh, treasury loans. Okay. Yeah. No, U.S. treasury loans. That's what? We were saying investments. I thought we were. Well, they're classified as investments because they're not as liquid. Yes. They're not as liquid as before. So. Would a CD be considered an investment? Um, probably technically it would have to be under this fair value measurement standard. But um, you know, a CD is fairly liquid. You can liquidate a CD and probably earn maybe some uh, lose some of the accrued interest that it may have earned. But for the most part, it's it's more liquid than probably a, a treasury note. Per se, they have to go and sell that. Uh, but the, the district's investments do have portions of the investments that are cash, they're cash equivalents. I'll get into that a little bit later when we start looking at the financials. But. Any other questions on those? The other two areas, um, talking about significant estimates and significant disclosures, um, certainly a significant estimate for the district that we, that we should um, take a look at is the depreciation. Um, that's a fairly substantial expense that flows through the operate, operations each year, but it is an estimate. It's the district pays for those assets up front and takes that asset as expense over whatever the useful life of that asset may be. 
Um, so it could be a, you know, a, a main or a structure of part of, the, part of the infrastructure. It could be 50 years or it could be a truck for, say, like five years. So those, those assets are, are reviewed by management and it's provided an estimated life and expensed over that period of time. So those are an estimate that's included in your financials. Looking at significant disclosures, uh, currently you don't have any real significant disclosures. The disclosures that are in your financials are pretty standard compared to, to most reporting and, uh, government entities. So we didn't feel any of those are, any, are too significant. Other areas that, we, that are required to communicate, such as if we had difficulties performing the audit, if there were misstatements that we found that, that management elected not to create, to correct, um, if we had any disagreements, some type of rep representations or consultations, or even f or any compliance findings, those type of issues, if we found those during our procedures, this is where we could communicate those in writing to the trustees. Um, you can see um, we didn't have any of those, those issues this year. The audit overall went, went fairly well. We had a few adjustments that were normal adjustments that we, that we tend to make, but um, the, the district was very ready for us, and we were in and out um, in the period of time. So thank you, Wendy. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to take a look at the financial statements, and again, these slides will continue with the slides as well, and they will, um, what I've put in the slides is maybe some additional financial trends that, that we can look at as we go through this, the areas of the financial statements. Um, first slide, looking at the financials, they have not changed the structure. There's no changes really compared to the prior year. There's still comparative financial statements, um, with the first couple pages being our opinion letter. Our opinion letter is put an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, which is a clean opinion to the district. Following our independent audit report is the management's discussion and analysis. Uh, this again reviews financial highlights of the district, and this is this is put together by management um, and inserted in our financial statements. So we don't audit that piece of information. The following financial statements um, include the statements of net position, which are the assets and liabilities and um, net position of the, of the district as of December 31st. Um, also, the statements of revenue and expenses and changes in net position. That's the revenue and expenses by each year. Uh, the statements of cash flow follow that along with the notes of the financial statement. Some of the, some of the numbers in your financials require further disclosure and a little bit more detail so the reader has a, a, a better assurance or better understanding of what those numbers represent. Those will be found in the notes. Uh, also in the back of the financial statements are the schedules of operating expenses. The statement of revenue and expenses and changes in that position, those are required to be uh, reported as a function, while the schedule of operating expenses breaks it down to your natural expense category. So you have a little bit more detail there. And then also in the back is the superintendent's report. So to take a look at the financial statements, I'm going to start out right on page 11 of the financials. This is the statement of net position. Again, it shows your assets, liabilities, and net position of the, of the district as of December 31st, 2016 and 15. And I put together some slides to kind of highlight some of these areas. The first, first slide talks about the growth of assets. And this is a five-year trend going back to 2012. Um, looking at these areas of assets that are on this statement of financial position. So they're grouped in categories of cash, the investments, accounts receivable, um, inventory, and other assets. Um, see over the past few years there's been certain growth in the investments. In prior years that was also known as the reserve accounts that have been set up that were in uh, money market funds. 
And you can see 2016 has switched over to um, investments. Uh, there's a little drop there because, again, as I mentioned before, and, and as you look at the financial statement, you can see that cash and cash equivalents is at $1.1 million right now. That because it, that, that's because it includes 560000 of cash equivalents that will be included in your investments. So as part of those portfolios that the investments are in, they do have accounts that are cash accounts um, for when things are sold and, and bought and have cash in them, cash equivalents. Um, those are actually required to be grouped in cash on your financial statements, even though they're in your investments on your books. And you can see on the financial statements, the, the cash is at 1.1 million, and your investments are at 2.2 million there. Um, other trends, you know, if you look at the accounts receivable, those are pretty consistent from year to year. That into this year, they're about 925,000. Um, I would expect each year that they would be consistent, unless there was a rate hike or um, a rate change or or even a a growth in the, the amount of connections into the into the district. Other uh, other areas such as inventory and other assets, those are, are smaller in size, um, but again, are pretty consistent from year to year. I have a question. Yeah. Sure. On page twelve, where you got the one point one cash cash You're right. No reading glasses, sorry. Page 13. what? Page 13. <laughs> um, there's a, a difference between 2016 and 2015. And is that mostly in the, uh, and I didn't really have a chance to look at this ahead of time, but where is most of that difference coming from? Which one are you looking at? The total bottom cash. Page 13. Total cash and cash. Total cash, 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 bottom cash, sheet, cash bottom and cash. Bottom of the sheets. There's a difference of about 1.8. Right. Uh, in, last year, all of the reserve accounts were included. They were in the money market funds. Right. So that's a, that's basically a cash equivalent. So okay. when we look at, even though we separated them on page 11, when you look at the cash flow, the overall change in cash and cash equivalents, both of those amounts are added together. So, at the end of this year, all of those money market accounts became actual investments. They were invested in, in So they securities. can't be shown on here in this Correct. statement. I just you, want to make sure yeah, that was if you, if you look up into the investing activities on the same page, you'll see a large cash going out for a purchase of investments. $2.2 million. All right. So that's the major difference right there. Yep. And that was due to the GASB 72? Yep. Well, that was, GASB 72 requires them to be recorded at the market. Um, oh. That would have happened anyways okay. because they're now in their notes. They're not much changed there. Correct. Correct. No. I think that's if you look back at page 11, yeah. you'll see other, 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 un, other assets, they have investments, $2.2 million in 2016, which didn't exist in 2015. All right, there we go. Yep. And that's, that's the same number. Yeah, it reflects that yeah. same. Yeah, that's the same number. Okay. And for the superintendent, I assume we'll actually see a growth on uh, accounts receivable just because of the, uh, the progress we're making in capacity reserve accounting. Well, can I jump in there? Sure. Basically, the accounts receivable is always going to be close to a million dollars at the end of the year because our billing goes out in December and the payments aren't due for 30 days. So at the year end, we're always going to have a large account receivable. So it's not really delinquent. There's no, not a large number of delinquencies there or anything like that, but it's just, it's just our fiscal year ends the same month that our last billing for that fiscal year goes out, and we bill in arrears, so it's always going to be a... So, oh, so we don't book that revenue when the bills go out. It shows as accounts received. I was just more or less discussing uh, the uh, reassessment of some of our um, uh, capacity reserves in reference to, like, the restaurants and so on. Yeah, it, uh, as... It, 
uh, with regards to uh, high strength ways to see that grow in if we continue on doing some more testing and find that. That's a good Any questions? Now this, this slide here doesn't include your capital assets because they're too large and you skew the, skew the graph. So I put them on the next. And again, the, the trend with the capital assets, this is an expected trend. You have a, a slow decrease of these assets. That's the depreciation each year that happens. So this is actually an expected trend. Those ended with uh, about $23 million at the end of the year. So if these if these charts were back far enough, you see the, the years that we made the investments in the uh, pump station replacements and the treatment plant upgrades, you'd see a large cash infusion into those assets, and those would be reflected. Those would be on the timeline for this analysis. The next slide looks at growth uh, liabilities. Uh, which is in the middle section of page 11, uh, the statement's next position. It kind of identifies all the, the different liabilities, and most of these are current uh, as of December 31st. And again, I've grouped some of these here uh, to take a look at uh, some of the trends. You can see the dark, the dark. I'm going to start from the bottom up. The, the credits, there was some credits involved with the bonding of the bonds, outstanding bonds, and those, those credits are slowly being amortized over, over the year. Thanks. I don't know. Does that look familiar to you? I don't know. Is that privileged information that I should have? Yeah, that probably. It okay. came out on a piece of paper, huh? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, the, the credits, you're going to see the decrease in the credits coming down. Uh, that's because they're being used up at the end of the year. There's, there's only a um, small portion remaining. This will, be, this will be used up in the next two years. Uh, you'll see a, a large spike in the accrued payroll, the light brown, this year. Um, the district policy is that when someone um, puts in their resignation, resignation retire, um, there are some benefits paid at the end of the retirement. This is the accrual of those benefits for Gary that's, that's in there um, for sick time and vacation time that's, that's held in. Um, most of other areas um, looking at these, they, they are about, they're fairly consistent from year to year. Uh, the, there is a decreasing trend though in the interest, which was which is natural with any type of um, financed uh, instrument. You're going to see your interest go down each year. Um, and at the end of the year, there were there were some additional accrued expenses reported, including uh, there's a deposit held on hand for uh, the possible lease lease arrangement. Um, those type of items are identified right on page 11. Um, way down from there. So, overall, though, looking at 2015 and 2016, they're they're fairly consistent um, each year, which is which should be expected. I have a quick question on liabilities. Why is it interest is on a liability? Yet the principal of these bonds that we need to pay back, which is real money that we have to pay back isn't considered a liability? Well, actually, the, the principal is just below, the next line down. You're going to see the bonds payable. They're, long, they're, they're classified as a long-term liability. These, the current liabilities are liabilities that are going to be paid within a year. Um, so you have accrued interest that's on those bonds that's been accruing since the last payment, but underneath the current liabilities are the long-term liabilities shown the bonds that are outstanding just under three million dollars. Is that the current ratio? Is that that graph there? No, nope, I'm, I'm still looking at page 11 on your financial statements. Oh. So you have your current liabilities oh, okay. and then your bonds. Yeah. Uh, 
the, the detail of the bonds are actually in the notes of the financial. They're on page 19 um, that, that actually has the maturities on, on those. And you can see there is one bond that's going to mature within two years. It's got two years left on it, so on the old bonds. I do, I do have a slide in there for the current ratio. Uh, the current ratio is a ratio you, uh, you look at for financial health of an organization. It does take into consideration the current assets and compares them to the current liabilities. So can, can the district pay its current liabilities with the current assets it has? That's, that's the basis, basis behind this ratio. And you'll see a drop in that, in that um, you'll see a, a, a drop in the ratio in 2016, primarily because last year all of those reserve accounts were cash equivalent, so they were classified as a current asset. Since those were now invested, they moved out of that, dropping um, the amount you have in current assets. Um, still, though, a 2.4 to 1 ratio is, is a strong ratio. It means you can pay your current liabilities um, almost two and a half times over, so that's still a strong, strong ratio. For an organization like us, what's the general rule? for a target for a ratio? Um, there's not necessarily a general rule. It all depends on um, future expectations of how much you're going to have reserve funds on hand, how, much, how you're going to set your rates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, uh, if you look at maybe some of the lending rules that are out there with certain financial institutions, uh, you know, a 2.4 to 1 ratio is definitely um, something uh, a bank would finance if you have that type of ability to pay off your current liabilities. And that change is still a little bit deceptive because the nature of our investments is really sure. speculative. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I did. You know, in previous years where those reserve funds were included in cash, you can see how it kind of skews that current ratio a little bit. So I did have, and I did have last year, the second slide of the current ratio, which took, took out those reserve funds to give more of a, a different look at the current ratio. And you can see that it actually has improved when you, when you look at prior years. Uh, last year it was 1.8 to 1, and now it's up to 2.4 to 1. So, we've got 15 times there. 1.2 to 1, that is not a good year. <laughs> 1.5. Um, and the next slide, looking at the net position, this is the equity, the equity in the district. Um, when you look at the financial statement, you see that the, the total net position is $23 million. Well, sometimes it, you know, if, a, if a reader doesn't understand, they may think that that's available cash or available ability to spend it. Um, the district actually has, has identified that basically $19 million of that is invested in your fixed assets, so it's unspendable. And, I, and I've kind of showed this on this graph, that a majority of your net position is basically your infrastructure. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the district. So you, do, you can see also that I've, I've taken from page 11 the $4.2 million of unrestricted, and I've actually separated it on this slide to show how much is being board designated into those investments and into those reserve funds. And then the, the unrestricted amount after that. So, you know, looking at your, at your assets, you're showing 2.2 of investments is really another 560000 that's a cash equivalent. So, out of that $4.2 million, you probably have another uh, $2.2 million that's been board designated. So, after that, the main portion is, is unrestricted. Any questions on that? I have put some slides in here to look at revenue trends. Uh, 
Now moving to page 12 of the financial, your statements of revenues, expenses, and changes in that position. These are the operating revenues and expenses. Also some non-operating revenues and expenses after that. Um, to come down to your change in that position, which is in, in a for-profit rate would be your profit or loss. Um, Net revenues actually went up about 150,000. Your operating revenues went up. The user fees went up about 150,000, while your operating expenses only went up about $4,000. So that's actually pretty good to be able to hold your operating expenses to just $4,000, um, especially the way some of the some of the type of expenses that the district has. Um, that's that's what caused that change in net position. Uh, before your capital contributions, kind of down towards the bottom of the page. That's why you have a, a smaller loss this year. It's down from 634000 to 465000 And just, just to, for further understanding, remember that uh, included in that loss, and, and we're going to see on the next page, um, which is your statement of cash flows, actually page after that, on page 14, $1.6 million of your expenses is actually depreciation. It's non-cash activity. So when you look at your, you know, the amount of cash flow from operations and, and it doesn't include that depreciation, you can see you're actually generating $1.2 million of cash flow just from your operations. When you add that depreciation on there, that's what's going to cause your loss. But that's not cash going out. That's, that's primarily just um, that estimate of depreciation over the year. But the trends of the user fees, um, yeah, you can see there's a slight growth. Um, it was just over $2.5 million in 2012. It's up close to $3.5 million now. It's actually three point, almost $2.4 million. Uh, so you do have a steady growth in, in your user fees. Your other revenue trends on the next slide, these are some of your smaller revenue sources. These have been fairly consistent for the past three years. You did have some, some fluctuations in, in prior years, but um, you know, for the most part, there's still, there's still some pretty consistent um, other revenue sources. Um, and finally, looking at your operating expenses on page 12, um, the breakdown of these expenses is in the schedule in the back of the financial, which, which breaks these down to the, your natural expense categories. It's on page uh, 21, 22. So it takes these operating segments and it breaks them down to the natural expense categories in the back. Any questions on this? One of the questions on the actual material that you presented is really straightforward. Okay. Good job explaining. However, um, just a question with regard to depreciation amounts. Um, at one point in time, I know the federal government was trying to uh, establish requirements for. Uh, utilities to be funding the depreciation so that they could uh, be sustainable and not have to rely necessarily on the federal government for huge grants down the road when depreciated assets actually had to be replaced. Uh, is, there any, is there any guidelines that you can give us with regard to um, what a business like ours should be actually salting away in anticipation of the actual expenses, what that these depreciation items actually translate to. But so depreciation actually is something that we have to be concerned about. It's just not a paper loss because it's indicating that our infrastructure is aging and at some point it will be fully depreciated, its useful life will be used up and it will have to be replaced. Right. So is there any guidance that you, that you could offer us with regard to where we should be or what we should have for goals? Well, I mean, depreciation can be misleading a little bit depending on 
um, an estimated useful life compared to what the actual useful life is going to be. So generally what I, I recommend is, is that um, possibly funding a reserve that's close to what you'd appreciate. Um, I think you're, you're funding your reserves right now along with, um, as, as your infrastructure is depreciated, um, I'm not exactly sure what was budget to put, put in on this no, year. No, not too much. Not too much this year. But I know we've been looking as a board at committing to larger amounts of reserves being set aside. Um, and historically in the past, we have we have set fairly large amounts and paid those into those reserve funds. We've depleted those funds, and we're actually waiting for this uh, bond, uh, 2018 bond, to be Retired, fully retired, and our plan then was to start to replenish our appreciation reserves. Yeah, the general rule of thumb that I see with districts is they they periodically do these five five year plans, ten year plans, looking at their infrastructure and actually comparing it to what's on the books, what's on the books, and how it's being depreciated. Um, certainly, like if if this district had in, in your 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 treatment plant's fairly new comparative, compared to a lot of places. Um, so if it has the capacity, if it's, if it's fairly new, then probably less depreciation needs to be funded. As that, like you said, as that gets older um, and assessments are done, those assets are looked at, um, you know, possibly more would be, would be put away. But the depreciation is just an indicator um, of the expense. I mean, it, it, a lot of times assets could last, will last more than what they're estimated to be. To be So continuing to, to review those assets and review the conditions um, and the capacity, um, you know, that's, that's what's going to give an indicator of, what, of whether you should ramp up how much you're putting away into your reserves. So from the financial statement perspective then, would there ever be a point in time where we might do a reassessment of our infrastructure and come back to you and say that gravity sewer that we had a 50 year lifespan on, we've reassessed and we think it has an additional 25 years of, of value and, we, and, and then would that be viewed more as an asset where you might, I don't know how you would offset the appreciation that you already had taken on it, but would there ever be an adjustment that would be made for that type of thing? Um, probably not, um, where you've made your initial estimate. Um, you certainly could take a look at that and, and you know, you could adjust the remaining value of that asset. Um, once it's fully depreciated though, I mean, usually there isn't a change in your, your estimate per se. Thank you. Yep. Well, I, I think we're starting to go down this road with that. It really comes down to an asset management program and you know looking at your assets and looking at the lifespan and based upon that creating your five to ten year plan on, on what you need to uh, replace. And you may have, you know, like you said, some of the assets last a lot longer if you you got a 75 years out of a force main or whatnot, and you only got, you know, you had 50 years of depreciation. No, that's great. But I think we we need to go and start looking towards that line of, you know, okay, what do we have? What's in the ground? What's the real age of it? What's the condition of it? And then what do we look at going forward for five to ten years out? Because we know we have something out here that, that that's questionable that could could come up at any Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you your thorough me. presentation and uh, clean report. So, thank you. Thank you. So, we need a motion to. Yeah, did you want to review your uh, report I, briefly? Yeah. Uh, I think that would probably be appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you mentioned there was another letter that I sent you. Here, it's in here, but oh, it's in here. I thought you said it was email. Right. 
Yeah. Which, which, which letter? Uh, the letter that he was talking about? Yeah, the letter to the trustee. Yeah, that's a two-page letter in the front of that bound book. Correct. Oh, I thought you said there's another letter. No, it's a New York bond. Though the one that you, David, had sent to them, gave to them, he didn't even it to them. Yes, it's, it's, it's an appendix in here. So David's report is in here, okay. But it was page 23. No, there's a statement. Is it, it was a, another letter that the statement put together that was included in the email that went out. Um, and it, it kind of summarizes, it, 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 I think it's like a few pages long, that, that um, both Wendy and I signed that uh, bullets. So I suppose the history of. Yeah, what, what we provided them and how we provided them and what we worked with. That he, usually he had included in this when he printed out the bottom copy, but it wasn't included in the printed copy. No. I know you were, you got a, a copy of it right there. Does right? somebody want to see that? The five page of that Dave and Wendy signed? It's which uh, you know, it was no malfeasance and any corruption. And uh, I, all the employees have been nice. And, I don't know if it says that. Is that what he converted to management discussion and yeah. analysis? Um, no, there's no, a separate a management separate. discussion oh, analysis. Right. It's this one right here, Joey. Um, I'm confused. Someone that came in the email, right? It was in the email, but it's not found in. It's not this found. one? Yes. Yeah, that one there. There wasn't another letter then? No. no. Okay, it's just the, this letter, that letter. Okay. Two letters. Okay, I don't check my email every day, so... I think I wish I would. I missed that one coming up. <laughs> well, I checked my own work. I don't know what it holds. Uh, so, I was going to say, that's something that's a problem to have. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. The one at home, we get a lot of uh, sale and, you know, a lot of all, every, everything out there we're registered on, it seems like. So, uh, I'll give a, a brief summary of our my annual report to the town and to the board. Um, and um, it's bound in, in the audit here, it begins on page 23, and um, what's, as I've done in years past, both the annual report and the audit will be available on our website. The PDFs, copies are available. Um, so, uh, this is a, please to submit the annual report for the Scarborough Sanitary District for the calendar year uh, 2016. Um, we collected and treat, uh, collection and treatment for services of 5,154 accounts, an increase of 48 accounts this year. 4,700 of them were residential and about 425 of them were commercial. Um, through these accounts, we provided almost $6,000 residential equivalent users um, of that. Made up of that is 29 commercial equivalent accounts. Um, in 2016, we issued 111 sewer permits. This is actually down a little bit from 2015. We did 220 years prior, uh, the year prior. Um, from what we issued this past year in permits, uh, an additional 1,000 feet of private gravity sewer and eight manholes uh, be constructed, another 792 of public gravity sewer and 10 manholes, uh, 1,400 feet of low pressure sewer main, uh, 260 feet of uh, sewer replacement, including a manhole, and 33 sewer service connections. Uh, so as of 2016, we have about uh, 68 uh, miles of gravity sewer, uh, 23 miles of force mains, uh, a little over 2,000 manholes, 23 pump stations, and our uh, 2.5 million gallon treatment plant. Um, in addition, there's about 6.1 miles of private gravity sewer, 6.6 .6 miles of private force main, and 34 private uh, pump stations um, that are connected to our system. We employ 13 employees uh, who provide the, all the services that the district provides. Our budget this past year was uh, uh, in 2016 
found at 16 was $3.4 million. Uh, we treated on average of uh, 1.24 million gallons per day. Uh, or overall, we treated 455 million gallons during 2016, of which we removed 95% of the uh, DOD and 97% percent of the total suspended solids. Um, we also provide services uh, for um, homes within Scarborough that are not connected to the to this, uh, our collection system. Um, you know, septic uh, uh, tanks are pumped and delivered to the uh, district to where it is disposed of and treated, uh, along with our wastewater. Um, and this past year, we treated about 400,000 gallons of septage. Uh, we compost our uh, sludge for uh, beneficial reuse and produce a Class A compost. Um, uh, this year, we uh, composted uh, 2,600 cubic yards of uh, sludge, and uh, with that, we combined another uh, 2,600 uh, yards of uh, amendment. Um, over the last few years, um, and, and last year specifically, we, we, uh, we added some uh, aeration tank actuators to improve our energy efficiency. We replaced a uh, uh, pump station emergency generator, and uh, we purchased some collection system odor control as well as some replacement uh, waste activated sludge pumps uh, that were just installed in the treatment facility. Um, uh, in summary, you know, we, we continue to, to, to provide, to find ways for improved efficiencies, uh, both financial and operational. Several of our goals for, the, uh, for this year, 2017, is to install odor control at um, uh, two of our pump stations, install some uh, an energy efficient aeration tank blower, or a small uh, 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 jock blower that can, uh, we can use in the sh uh, shoulder uh, to provide um, uh, aeration. Update our collection system on and manual, and in including uh, CCTV investigation, uh, evaluate building software, uh, update our asset management plan, and update our studio regulation of the quality program. And so in closing, um, I'd like to open it up to uh, any questions. This is the annual report. Any questions for the superintendent for the annual report? On the subject, <coughs> when you look back in the years, we were over 500,000, and now we're down to 396. Is it, we we, we taken were we before taking septage from outside of Scarborough or something? Is that the reason? No, we always took septage from within Scarborough. Only Scarborough? Only Scarborough. Uh, there's some... We, are, if we did stop taking septage from uh, Bailey's Camp Town. Oh, okay. Uh, where they, every spring, uh, they have, I, I, can't, I don't remember how many tanks there are, but... Uh, the septage hollow would, would haul for a month straight septage from Bailey's campground and introduced it into our uh, treatment plant. And it was of such a large volume that it started providing operational problems at the treatment plant. And uh, we worked with them and found them another disposal site. Okay, so that actually ends up being cheaper. And that, and, but, but that's the difference, really? That's, I mean, that's the primary right. difference. And we, we get 100,000 gallons of septage from them. I think the report was nicely done. Uh, it was a good, concise summary of our operations. And, uh, a nice statement of the goals for the, for the current year also. So, thank you for that. If there's no other questions, then we would need a motion to accept the superintendent's report and the auditor's report. As, as the annual report for the district. So, second. Moving and second, any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. So, do you need a motion?
motion? We're good. For an executive session? Well, um, just a brief question. Um, before we before we get a motion for executive session, if, if we don't think we're going to be taking action, we might want to do the budget summary and trustee comments so that we don't have to keep Wendy here. So let me ask you, Dave, if you think that there would be an action item that you'd be looking for coming out of the executive session, or if that would be something scheduled for the next week? Um, I think since the, you know, this could be a controversial item, uh, and it's not on the agenda, I think it would probably be best that we wait a month to actually okay. act upon it. That way it can be publicly, you know, Okay, so without objection, I'll take the budget summary, public and trustee comments out of order, and then we will adjourn to executive session. Okay. So um, let's do the budget summary. Uh, three-month uh, budget summary is
uh, and a uh, huge shout out to Wendy and the rest of the staff for another successful audit year. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Aubrey? Yeah. So, uh, uh, echoing, echoing the, the comments of others, I just wanted to tell a funny story. I first did my first project for the district about 10 years ago. And uh, kind of new to wastewater at that time, so it was a little bit challenging, some of the projects that we have. Uh, so I was working with Gary Lozano, Superintendent, Gary Howard, Chief Operator, and I called them the good Gary and the bad Gary. Right? And of course, as a good consultant, I was always careful to say, you know, to be careful which one I was in the room with, so that was always the good Gary. But Gary really did... Um, uh, he did serve as a good mentor to me uh, for operations, but also personality. I think something it, we haven't said a lot, I mean, Gary, technically very savvy, but also such a good attitude, I think, and really interested in teaching staff, and I think that his, um, his, his skills and his demeanor are a lot of why the district is what it is now. So I know we're all very proud to be trustees. I'm very proud when I see our trucks around town. I'm very proud of them the staff and the good work they do. So I hope you have your feet up around a campfire right now at your campground. And thank you so much for your service and for being a good friend. Okay, uh, all right, so, so Gary did kind of mold the culture of uh, the district over the years, and I think uh, it, it resembles him quite a bit, and I want to thank him for that. Uh, the audit, uh, did a nice job on the audit again this year, uh, working with the auditors. Be no problems we have, so. and uh, thank all the rest of the crew for all the work they Thank you. I'm not to belabor the point. I, I'll reiterate our thanks to all the staff. Um, I'll mention Wendy also, in addition to those already named, for her work on the audit, and uh, that uh, those clean audits don't happen uh, with a week's worth of work when the auditor comes in. So thanks for your ongoing efforts to. Uh, Keep everything appropriate and uh, work on the day to make sure that uh, we don't get any negative letters from the audit as we were last week. So I appreciate that. And also, um, very sorry I was unable to attend Gary's retirement party, but none of you guys would have wanted to have seen me that night. <laughs> and, uh, probably not for a few nights before, for a couple nights after. Uh, but I, I really, really was uh, upset that I was unable. To attend it, and I did visit with Gary uh, yesterday for a little while at the plant. We talked. He and I had gone back a long time, and uh, he, I was the superintendent for ten years and worked directly with Gary, and that was a joy and pleasure all the time. It was really a good time, and his total dedication uh, to the district and his availability. It's unparalleled. In all of my years of work, I never have found anybody as committed, dedicated, and consistently available to the job as he was. And uh, it, it was impressive. And we have a lot of other staff people who are demonstrating that same level of commitment. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. So I just want to wish Gary well and uh, hope that we get to see his face frequently when he gets back from his months. Uh, with that, um, I think it would be appropriate to take a motion to adjourn to executive session, not to return uh, for any further action uh, at this point. So moved. Second. All those in favor?